Welcome to Talking Giants Player Profiles and Projections. I'm your host, Bobby Skinner, here with my co-host, Justin Panic. And today, we're starting off with offensive lineman, right guard, Mark Glowinski, who's six foot four, 310 pounds, 31 years old, signed a three-year, $18.3 million contract last offseason and was the biggest deal for the first year of Joe Shane, with only Tyrod Taylor, Ty- Tyrod Taylor being the second biggest and John Feliciano the third on a one-year, $2.5 million deal. Was there very clear... Hey, we got enough money to make one middle-of-the-road contract. It was Mark Gawinski trying to stir up that offensive line. This season has an $8.3 million cap hit with $8.6 million of dead cap. They can't cut him after this season. He de- he has a $7.2 million cap hit next season with $1.5 million dead cap. And I I am expecting that to, be, to happen. Yeah. Because, Justin, I didn't have high hopes for Mark Gawinski last season. But even then, I thought his 2022 was a disappointment. Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, I think neither of us had too high of a hopes for Mark Lewinsky. I think a lot of Giants fans were excited just because it was it was any offensive line move. That, it was the first signing of the Joe Shane era. Yeah, and especially coming from the offensive line, the interior offensive line, where you know we were expecting that a right tackle to be drafted at that point last year so you know knowing that we can hopefully get one of those positions squared up it got a lot of fans excited and we were expecting Mark Lewinsky cuz i think it's kind of maybe two different conversations or Mark Lewinsky as a run blocker the Mark Lewinsky as a pass blocker we were expecting Mark Lewinsky to have some bad moments last year and one of the things that we said last year is hopefully you know the bad moments aren't bad enough where it just Tanks, where it could tank a drive, where it maybe could tank tank a game. Like we were hoping that it wouldn't get that bad, and you know, in, in previous years, it wouldn't be that bad for Mark Lewinsky. But man, it was it was worse than we thought. Well, in previous previous seasons, he was like a slightly below average pass blocking guard, and he's an above average uh, run blocker, especially yeah, more so in space than just lining up with the guy. But I mean, last year we gave five sacks, four hits, and twenty five pressures. He had the ninth worst pass blocking efficiency numbers for guards last year, which measures you know sacks, hits, and pressures per snap uh, with a weight weighted towards sacks, and seventh worst in true pass sets, which didn't include you know plays that didn't include play action or RPOs or whatever, um, and and that and while being ninth worst, that's why he got a little better in the last four games of the season, Justin. But for the majority of the season, when I would go through those numbers every week, and when I was saying, hey. Gates should be at center, and Bredesen, like like somebody, like somebody, you know, Bredesen, Bredesen be sure should be like Glowinski should not be starting over Ben Bredesen at any point last season to me. Like I really thought they should uh, should have you know started uh, or Bredesen over him, but he was in bottom five for the majority of the season in that, and it was always like around rookies. It was like rookie guards had a really maybe it was just last year, but had a really bad time in pass protection. And it it wasn't just like you look at the numbers type of stuff. He was bad on film, man. Yeah. Like he was really bad on film, had disaster games. And it started to me playing with a high pad level and with an exposed chest. Like it's it won, like I said, the high pad level, that's not good. But his hands came from low, um, and he didn't really punch, so he never was he like he never was aggressive in his pass sets. Like you watch Ben Bredesen, he's aggressive. He goes and gets hands on you. Glowinski kind of let the pass rush come to him. His hands came from low, play with a high upper upper or a high pad level, and I don't think his upper body strength is very good. And it just led to some ugly, ugly reps and consistently. Like I said, it got better in the last four games of the season or so, but for the majority of the season, and the numbers show it, it was really, yeah. really bad. Where, like. You know, it's Evan Neal was really bad, and Glowinski was really bad on that right side of the offensive line. And I thought it showed, it's it reared its ugly head the most against Justin Simmons week one, which, hey, he's, or excuse me, Jeffrey Simmons against week one, where, hey, he, you know, he's a tough opponent. He's one of the best interior defensive linemen in the league. But then even, I can't even remember the interior defensive line against the Panthers, but he got absolutely dog-walked against the Carolina Panthers. I think it was Panthers. Matthew Iannotis. Which, I mean, talk to me about the, the like, I remember the phrase you used is like the meat hook, right? Is that the phrase? Yes, yeah, where they just kind of go and they literally attack the back. Because he plays with that high pad level, Justin. And if you're not watching this on, on, can, on YouTube right now, just imagine someone just taking their arm and just going underneath your armpit and attacking your back. Yeah. Like they're going to try and stab you the back from underneath your armpit. And with that high pad level, with his, with his hands coming from, uh, from his hips, it just kind of left that open. And 
there were times where even when they didn't use that move, like where they got into his chest and they were just able to take it, like just take advantage of not great upper body strength. And, you know, there was play action plays that this happened where it was just like he would get, he would get worked. And there is a defensive lineman running, you know, almost untouched to the quarterback. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So. I don't know if there's going to be improvement. Uh, you know, hopefully, you did say that it got it got a little bit better as the season went on. So, I still am penciling in Mark Lewinsky as the Giants' starting right guard this season. I'm hoping for some sort of improvement from him from last year. Let's talk about him in the run game because there is some good stuff in the run game. Uh, he's not a guy. Like I said, because I don't think he has the best upper body strength. He plays with a little bit of a higher pad level. He's not a guy who's going to be an earth mover in the run game. But what he does well is he is very athletic to move and get to the second level. Like, you look at some of the Giants' biggest runs, and even at the end of the season against the Colts or the Vikings, he would come from the backside and cut off play side linebackers, which is, like, if you watch the way that NFL linebackers move, man, like, it is hard to just get the the linebackers on your side of uh, of the center, to cut to cut them off on those plays where they are flowing, and he would he would go off and cut off play side linebackers, and that is where Gawinski is valuable. Is that athleticism as a team that's going to run a lot of gap runs, going to move their offensive linemen? He is valuable in that where that can create big runs, and especially with a back like Saquon Barkley, you run a little bit of pin and pull. Well, guess what? When you pin and pull, you you uh, you sacrifice some stuff on the front side of the blo- of the blocks with the linebackers. He can allow you to you know create let those runs go from four or five yards to fifteen to twenty yards. And we've heard in previous years from you know some people just around the Giants that the Giants have wanted to implement even with past coaching staffs like outside zone stuff. You're not doing that with Mark Lewinsky. You're not doing that. You're not doing that with Mark Lewinsky. Like just you're talking about zone blocking. Well, just. Ru- Kind of just running outside the tackles. Oh, out, yeah. Um, and I think I just remember that there are plays where Glowinski's able to get on out the back in side, space. on the back side, but on the front side, I, it's not great because he's not like you say, he's not really moving guys, and he's easily shut. Right, right. But just Glowinski's ability to move out in space and to get out there, um, even just move from the first level to the secondary level, um, it helps, and it and it spurred runs last year. And you know, I I don't know if the Giants have the same rushing attack if Mark Glowinski isn't the right guard for them. Let's talk about projection, and this is my projection. If he's the starter at the end of the season, I think that means the coaching staff is either stubborn with their first big contract or Azudu hasn't developed because Ben Bredesen is better than him and Azudu hopefully will be. And, hey, maybe he can have a resurgence in his career, but even then, he was never a great player. You know, we're not talking about some guy who was great with Indy. Like, he was okay. Mm-hmm. Like he was at times an average pass blocker, at other times a below average pass blocker, and like we mentioned, the run game. He's not. I mean, he's not some dominant force in the run game. He can move and help you uh, attack angles. Um. So I mean, that is that is my projection. Is that if he's starting at the end of the season, it's because either Azudu has not developed, or they're being stubborn and don't want to play Ben Bradison. Yeah, I I'd agree with that. Uh, and, and if I had to put my money on it. It would be because of Azudu not developing at the at the rate that he's that he's supposed to. I actually do trust that this. I do trust as of right now that this coaching staff will not be stubborn if the opportunity is there. There's just no way they could with the young. Like both those players are young. Um, I just couldn't like Azudu. They drafted and Ben Bredesen was someone who worked his way up from third string last uh, training camp to you know, becoming what I thought was their best interior offensive lineman. Um, he just doesn't move as well as, as Mark Lewinsky in space. Is this his last year as a giant? Yes. Okay, I agree. Yeah. He's got a nice beard, though. Does have a nice beard. What could he use to shave it if he wanted to? He could use Manscaped to shave it. He could use it to especially... if he. Why would you want to shave that beard? If you just want to upkeep it, if you want to keep it clean... If you want to itch it with like a beard brush, because I heard that the beard brush is like absolutely just fantastic. And everything is part of the Manscaped Platinum Package 4.0 that includes the Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, uh, the Weed Whacker Ear and Nose Hair Trimmer. Mark Lewinsky looks like a guy that has a lot of nose hairs. Like, just looks like a guy that it's, well, you it's can a just, problem. You don't, it's not a looks like. Does he have nose hairs or not? I think he does. I haven't gotten that close to him. He needs Manscaped. Maybe I'm going to ask him. Uh, well, we're at Giants Lions joint practice. Maybe I'll ask him uh, when I see him tomorrow. But uh, Ultra Premium Body Wash, 2-in-1 Shampoo and Conditioner, and Deodorant 
and they have so much more as well. Uh, I want you to get 20% off and free shipping with the code GIANTS at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com when you use promo code GIANTS. Use the Platinum Package because the gold standard is no longer good enough. Thank you to Manscaped for sponsoring these PPPs. Bobby Skinner, you'll be glad you did. You'll be glad you did. Next up, Micah McFadden, six foot two, 232 pounds, 23 years old. is a fifth-round pick uh, in the Giants' first draft class under Joe Shane. Last season, played a little bit at the start, got taken out, and then put back in the starting lineup. He had 59 tackles, two sacks, and six tackles for a loss. He actually got benched again. He got benched for Jared Davis in the playoffs. That being said, he did have the most tackles for a loss on the team after Jihad Ward and Dexter Dexter Lawrence, who mm-hmm. they both had seven. Micah McFadden had six. And in fact, when you compare them to the other linebackers, Tay Crowder, Jalen Smith, Austin Calicho, and Jared Davis, they combined for nine. So, you know, the other four linebackers that played, they had three more than he did. Now, not the great not comparing him uh, to the best linebackers there, that's for sure. McFadden has struggled with on what he can be because there's some good stuff that he does, and he's got athleticism to do some good stuff, but I just don't know if it's ever going to be put together in an, in the NFL. Like, he moves pretty well. I think if he gets downhill and, like, works solid angles, he slips blocks very quickly. Like, be- definitely better than any of the Giants linebackers last year, and I think he works laterally well, and there's some pass rush ability there too, but I don't think it's good enough that's going to get him to the next level in the NFL because I think, one, he's a little undersized, at 6'2", 232. And I just... I, I need a guy that's, that's that size and that athlete to do some things in coverage, and he just really struggles. He's talked a lot about like his, his work and his development in, in coverage this offseason, though. Yeah, and that's what, what you give him hope, because you, you did see some good stuff at Indiana with him in coverage, like turning his zone into man, like yeah, having good instincts, shutting down progressions uh, for the quarterback there. He almost had an interception against the Texans that went through his hands, and then it wound up being like a 20-plus yard gain for the Texans because the receiver wound up catching it. Yeah, so it's in the – but let's, let's start with, let's the, start run with game, the run game. game, though. Like I said, if he's using his like hands, he can slip blocks pretty damn quickly. Right, like it's it's, and he does it smoothly. Like when you get him going downhill, it's a, it's a really nice thing. He works laterally well, but the thing is, is when he does have to take on a block, he struggles to shed those blocks once yep. they're on him. Yeah, didn't make very many stops near the line of scrimmage in that, and also some of that downhill trigger with the, uh, you know, like you know, slipping guys left him struggling in coverage because it's like. He needs to win by getting downhill quick, which leaves him as a liability in some play action, play action pass stuff. What's going on, dude? And some play action pass stuff. So I just don't know if that package of talent is going to fully come together in the NFL. Yeah, and right now it is, and I don't know, because Micah McFadden played next to terrible, terrible linebackers last year and, and Micah McFadden is a is a will he's not he's not a Mike right yeah and I do think he was he will play a lot better next to Bobby O'Carrick yeah which I, I would say I mean you know, we had a little debate on this before before we hopped on but I do think his best game of the season last year came the last game of the regular season versus the Eagles he had a season high four run stops and that was the game that Gerard Davis and him were basically starting together he had Gerard Davis at, at Mike and you know Micah McFadden at, at that will spot and, you know, he lined up all over the field. I think one of his two sacks came in that game where he actually started out lining up as an edge rusher. I think he beat a tight end to go to to go and get Jalen Hurts. He looked active. He looked fast. He was moving well laterally. I will say, like, the times that I feel like Micah McFadden gets in trouble is, number one, when he can't slip the block automatically. It's not like he takes on blocks and then he sheds it. He has to slip it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when he's – and also when he's when he's pat, when you see the feet pat a pat a pat and when he kind of, he's kind of hesitating, that's where I feel like Micah McFadden can get in trouble. But when he flows and he's understanding where, where he needs to be and where the play is going and his instincts are good, he, he, can t- he can deliver a pop with guys. And you know even if he doesn't make a play, and if he faces a tight end in a, in a spot, if he faces a fullback in a spot, that can disrupt a play enough. You know, if he, just, he has his moments. And yeah. I think that's the difficult thing with Micah McFadden because you see some of the moments and it's like, all right, well, let's just see this a little bit more, but it's not consistent enough because, like I said, you know, the Eagles game was – that was a season high four run stops. He might have had one or two other games with three run stops, and, you know, the rest of it was – you know, there's there was more to be desired. Yeah, it's just – he needs – like you said, he needs to be 
quick and aggressive and downhill, but that leaves him vulnerable in other spots. Like I remember playing the Lions where he's taken on a fullback and he doesn't take on the fullback. He slips the fullback block and they see that that's the way that Micah McFadden uh, beats blocks and not by taking them on, stacking them and shedding them. So what does the fullback do? Show like he's going to block and then slips out for a wheel yeah. route for a nice little... I th- actually, I think he dropped it. But it would have been a nice little game. Yeah. Uh, and then also it's... Like, he's late to his coverage drops. You know, I don't think it's because he's, like, super slow. Now he's got, like, these short arms that aren't able to go up and make plays on the ball. But he just struggles to get to his his drops and coverage. And I do wonder if he need like, some of that stuff is confidence-based in him. Because, like you mentioned, the, the Eagles game, I thought his best game was against the Seattle Seahawks, which was his first start in the NFL. He came in. He uh, had a sack on Charles Cross, which I think is something that he does have that none of the other linebackers really have is a pass rush ability. You yep. saw that in Indiana. He just has quick hands and he works laterally well with solid footwork. And he had like he bent the he bent the corner versus Charles Cross. Yeah, I think you about know, sixty-three like, snaps he spent on the edge last year. Yeah, and they you know the, and we know Wink Mardell likes to use those alignments um, with their with his linebackers over there. So he can do stuff like that, but I just don't know if he's going to be out there in those opportunities enough to really flash that pass rush ability. Um, but it's just kind of – he's late reacting to matchup and man, and I think he just loses the size battle. Like there's even times where it's like, hey, he can be in good coverage on a tight end or whoever, but those tight ends are just going to be able to kind of box him out and, and make yeah. those plays. Yeah, for sure. Um, tackled well last year. I mean, I, I'd say that was the biggest plus of his of his rookie year is that he, you know, he tackled pretty well, 4.8. Missed tackle rate pro fo- pro per pro football reference. That's always tough sometimes. Um, so I thought that that's a big positive from his rookie year. Yeah, yeah, and, and I mean the Giants were actually like one of the best teams in not missing tackles last year, which speaks to a disciplined coaching staff. Um, and and he, I so in all of this, I know we've been critical of Michael McFadden. I do have him as the Giants' starting inside linebacker after Bobby next to Bobby O'Carrick over, Dar- over Darian Beavers. Yeah. It's a tough position. It's a tough position to play. Not fun to say that, but that's what I do believe is going to happen. It should happen. It's a tough position to play. The Giants clearly, across multiple regimes, <laughs> have not invested a lot of good resources into into interior linebacker, especially at this interior linebacker two spot where we've been asking guys that have been drafted in the sixth, seventh round to either be interior linebacker number one or be interior linebacker number two playing, you know, playing next to a competent guy. So Micah McFadden has a, has a, you know, a, a tough job with a high expectation being that six round pick, but uh, compared to the other guys on the roster as of right now, which is Darian Beavers, which he's basically entering into his rookie year, Deontay Johnson's a UDFA and then, you know, Carter Coughlin and Cam Brown are special teams guys. So Mike, Micah McFadden, it being his second year, he knows what he did bad last year. He's reflected on what he needs to get better at. He's talked a lot about getting in depth about, you know, get, you know, getting back in coverage and getting in phase quicker. So um, I'm excited to see what, my, what Micah McFadden could do next to competent linebacker. Yeah, there is some hope in him. You know, one playing a, a next to Bobby O'Karake should help where – like I talk about confidence, it's a lot harder, easier to be confident when you see your your partner flowing compared to Jalen Smith, where he <laughs> just kind of just standing there and allowing right, guys to win the angle <laughs> battle with him. You gonna move? Um, you know, so hopefully that helps with it because it's a lot easier as that. You know, we even saw with Tay Crowder. Like, when did Tay Crowder actually look pretty decent? Twenty twenty. Next, next to Blake Martinez, who was like great at IDing the run. So, uh, anything else on Michael McFadden? No, that's it. Uh. Some people are saying that I look like him because I looked like Blake Martinez and Micah McFadden kind of looks like Blake Martinez. Are you a Pokemon scammer? No, Micah McFadden isn't either. That's already one good new, one good thing from his all linebacker. All right, we will see you guys on the next one. Until then, let's go Big Blue.